Humans have crack systems too. Mm -hmm. And if I'm around you long enough, I will find out what the stress points are. In cybersecurity, we talk a lot about security awareness, but this is a whole different ballgame. This is someone that's being recruited to steal information. Do you think now is like just a treasure trove of access for both people that are doing corporate espionage and even like nation state level espionage? They expected me to manipulate, to exploit, to subvert, and to suborn people and to persuade them to commit treason against their countries. One of the first conversations that you and I had was about this concept of humans being the weakest link in cybersecurity. And we said, oh, I mean, that's, is that really fair? But we had to bring someone into this conversation that has a rare insight into the human psyche. So from your perspective, like whether you're talking about it within cybersecurity or even in just a general business or organization, are humans the weakest link and why? Absolutely. In my opinion, they are always the weakest link. You can have all the cyber defenses in the world. You can construct this absolutely impregnable castle with a moat, a deep moat. And yet, if I have one person inside the castle walls on the other side of the moat, your cyber defenses are absolutely worthless. I talked to a, a very good friend of mine once who is the, uh, was the leading cyber expert at Oak Ridge National Lab where we have a lot of our top classified secrets and things. And I asked him, I said, Bob, if I were a Russian intelligence officer and you were my human asset and I wanted to be able to access all of the classified information at this laboratory remotely at my office in Moscow, could you do it? And he proceeded over the next 10, 15 minutes to describe for me how he could personally enable that, could jump the firewalls, jump the so-called moat between the separation between classified and unclassified, and how I could read plain text every deep, dark, classified secret that they had. And the other caveat that I had was, and I don't want you to get caught. Mm. He said, no, they would never find me. Mm. So and if I control a well-placed human being it's all about access. Alan Dulles, who founded the CIA, said it's all about access. Mm -hmm. And if you, Ron, have the access that I need, suddenly you and I are, are going to be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> you hear a lot about air gap systems, especially when you think of NSA, CIA, other agencies as well. But you're almost describing that it doesn't matter sometimes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. If you control somebody inside, then you know, the uh, defenses are down. I describe it as an electronic Maginot line. The Maginot line was what the French constructed before World War II. Absolutely, these pillboxes, all of this stuff, you know, they spent hundreds of millions, billions of dollars against the Germans. But they ignored the part around Belgium because Belgium was a neutral. But did Adolf Hitler respect neutrality? No. He came in that way, the Maginot line was worthless. What people sometimes do is they construct what I call an electronic Maginot line. Mm -hmm. And it gives them, gives them great comfort, helps the cyber defense companies out. They're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if I control one well-placed asset inside of those cyber defenses, it's worthless. Take, for instance, Ed Snowden, Edward Snowden. He basically was the human insider that betrayed all of those NSA secrets. Mm. And by the way, 95% of those NSA secrets that he betrayed had nothing to do with Americans. It had to do with our foreign collection capabilities against our adversaries like Russia and China and mm -hmm. others. He betrayed those and he was the human penetration. People refer to the technical part, but he just downloaded all right. of these NSA programs. So he's a classic example of the insider who basically defeated the, all those NSA defenses. 
When you look at your history, I mean, when we did a poll on LinkedIn, 80% said that humans are the weakest link in cybersecurity, just across the board. We have all these programs about awareness. We're trying to teach everybody about all the threats that are out there. But still, people believe that people are the weakest link. From your perspective, what makes a human so susceptible to things like espionage and insider threat? Well, humans are just inherently fallible. They have, you know, the great psychologist, sociologist Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you have, you need food, you need things like that, shelter, you need clothing, you need things for your family. And machines don't need that. Mm -hmm. Machines really don't need that. In fact, I say there are no hard targets. There's only hard access. I was insulted when I was overseas and working in a CIA station where the case officers like me, my colleagues who were pursuing Russian targets or Chinese targets, they were the so-called hard targets branch. Right. Well, that's insulting to me because there's no hard targets, there's only hard access. Mm -hmm. Now, in my case, I had a, a particular burden that I bore because I was betrayed by Ed Howard, who was a friend of mine in the CIA mm -hmm. uh, when I first came in in 1980 and he and I were good buddies. He was going to be designated to be a case officer handling some of our most sensitive assets in Moscow. Well, Ed had an unfortunate uh, substance abuse problem, terrible substance abuse problem, and he did some incredibly stupid things. Like one time he was on an airplane and a woman with a baby was sitting next to him and the baby was crying like babies do. Mm -hmm. She got up to go to the bathroom and Ed just to, because he was so angry, he rifled her purse and stole $40 out of it just to see that he, I know, you're, you're wrinkling your face. Yes, exactly, just to see, show that he could do it. He admitted that later on a counterintelligence polygraph at the CIA. Mm. And so here we have a guy who's basically guilty of theft, uh, incredibly bad judgment, anger management issues, substance abuse issues, and so they were going to, uh, they fired him. Now, mm -hmm. they might have, could have handled it a little better, but they fired the guy. But he had already been exposed to some of our most sensitive assets in Moscow, including Alfred Tokachev, who was later designated the billion dollar spy because he had the key to all of the most advanced Soviet defenses and especially the aviation defenses. He worked in a key institute and did that. Well, my friend Ed betrayed Tolkachev and Tolkachev was shot. Mm -hmm. Okay. About a year or so later, we get a defector, a Russian defector, and he then describes the spy that the Russians had recruited. And even though he didn't know Ed Howard's name, he, in fact, he had an alias using Robert, he described him so well that the fingers were pointing definitely at Ed Howard. And so Ed, uh, by that time, like I said, had been fired, and he decided to defect to the Russians, and he did. He slipped FBI surveillance. He was living in New Mexico at the time, slipped surveillance with his wife, and flew, we think, to Helsinki first and then to Moscow. So later in my career, my wife called me at the embassy where I was stationed, and she said, all she said to me was, she said, Jim, look at the front page of the Herald Tribune. I looked and I see splashed across the front page, my friend, Ed Howard, has defected to the Soviet Union. Now, that was a kick in the gut. But then about a year or so later, when I was getting ready to transfer from this, that office to another foreign posting, we have a practice in the CIA where we inform the chief of station of the station that's receiving you have you had any cover exposures, just so they know the types of operations that you can participate in safely or not, especially if you've been exposed to hostile intelligence like the Russians or the Chinese. And so they sent the chief of station where I was going, a cable, and they sent me the cable. And under my name, it said, betrayed by the traitor Ed Howard. Mm. Your friend. My friend. Now. Ron, what if you got a cable that said about Chris Cochran, betrayed by the traitor, Chris Cochran? I'd be shocked. Shocked. I'll be hurt. I'll be confused. A knife in the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really, it had, you know, I guess intellectually I had thought about him being a traitor, but then when I thought personally, I've been betrayed by the traitor, Ed Howard. So later in that tour, 
I would try and invite KGB officers or suspect KGB officers out for lunch to begin our development so I could try and recruit them. Well, they had already been warned by Ed Howard that I was a CIA officer. So they would all, you know, laugh and say, well, I'm too busy or, you know, you know how you used to get brushed off by a good looking girl when you were asking her out, you know, you know, when my my uh, great aunt's going to die and I can't <laughs> go out with you. These are for sale. <laughs> yeah, <these are> right, <laughs> right. But so, it's also more than that, it's very dangerous for you, right? Well, I, to an extent, yeah. I mean, they were, they were not going to kill me, mm -hmm. but they were not going, they had already been instructed by their chief of counterintelligence, do not mess around with Jim Lawler. He is a known CIA officer. He's out to recruit you mm -hmm. and your career will be toast if you go out with him. So I could get nobody, you know, I couldn't get a date. <laughs> <laughs> My mom didn't actually know that I was going to be born with a birth defect. It used to bother me quite a bit. She is just like you guys. The message of control and complexity doesn't just apply to one subject in life. That is a universal truth. When a challenge feels too big, break it down to the parts that you can control. This sounds like a whole different ballgame because in cybersecurity, we talk a lot about security awareness, how to not click a link, how to not accidentally upload or download the wrong information from something like Google Drive. But this is a whole different ballgame. This is someone that's being recruited to steal information, which to me sounds a lot easier than trying to create a zero-day exploit, throw it at the right computer and pivot around. This is direct. Is this something that's expensive to do in nature, or is this something that's cheaper to build than technology? If you're asking me uh, how expensive it is to recruit someone, right? Oh, that's very cheap. It can be, I mean, it can be pennies, mm. uh, and it may take some time. Right. Uh, I had one target that I was pursuing. We call them targets when I'm going after somebody to recruit. It took me 11 years to recruit one specific target. So. As far as time invested, yeah, it could be a long time. And then it has been as short as what we call a cold pitch, where a cold pitch is, let's say, Ron, I know that you have access to information I really want, but I've never met you before, but I'm 100% sure you have the access. But I also know that you are leaving my country and you're only here for maybe a day or so. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have time to develop a relationship of trust with you, which is typically the way we go about recruiting people. And so we exercise what we call a cold pitch, where hopefully I may have some background about you. I may know that perhaps that you have some gambling debts or that you have some marital issues. Of course, Chris has been telling me all about that. <laughs> but, uh, there could be a drinking problem. It could be some other issues, stresses in your life. Because I'm always looking for stresses. You all got problems. Everybody, everybody. If you don't yeah. have problems, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and so when I was a young man, I was a rock climber. The way you climb a rock is you look for the crack systems. Mm -hmm. And you can't see the crack system from a long way off. You have to get close and you study. Now, where am I going to put my hands, my feet? If I make this move, then how do I make the next move? Right. Humans have crack systems too. Mm -hmm. And if I'm around you long enough, I will find out what the stress points are. Mm -hmm. Never once in my career did I recruit a happy person. Mm -hmm. You don't recruit happy people. Mm -hmm. You recruit people under stress. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of my 11-year romance of this one target, this gentleman had no cracks mm -hmm. that I could detect for the longest time but he and I were friends. In fact, I cold called him. He had just arrived in the country I'd arrived in. I saw him on the diplomatic list. We had gotten a notice from our CIA headquarters that they were very interested in people from his country that had certain access. So I just cold called him and asked him out to lunch. And we went to lunch. You start, what happens when you go to lunch with somebody, you start talking about hobbies and things. Right. It turns out we're both long distance runners. Mm -hmm. Now. I asked him, I said, how would you like to go running with me this Saturday? He said, sure. Mm -hmm. So we went running. Now, there's a big difference, though, between him and me. Number one, he was 10 years younger. <laughs> Number two, what I didn't know was he's a world-class marathoner. What? Yeah, what? Yeah, right. So I'm out there running with this guy, 
And I always like to tell folks, you don't recruit people when you're talking. You recruit mm -hmm. people when you're listening. Right. Okay? Yeah. Well, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> I, I was... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I had to listen. I was breathing hard, and he was talking just like a little bubbling teapot. Mm -hmm. And we became really good friends, legitimately really good friends. I love the guy. And would invite him to our home and things. He had no stresses in his life. He was single. He was uh, making a good living. He was enjoying his job. I think he had a pretty good boss. The uh, racial group that he was in was in charge of his country at the time. Mm -hmm. This guy, he was on cloud nine. Now, he was slipping and telling me some things that he shouldn't have told me. Like, for instance, he told me the name of one woman that worked at the uh, embassy. And he says, you know, she's got the title of administrative assistant, but in fact, she's the code clerk. So she shouldn't have told me that. He said, well, she's the uh, code clerk. And they were best buddies. At, it was a small embassy he was at, and they were best friends. And he was telling me a story about her and referred to her and said, well, she's really the code clerk. And he shouldn't have said that. He, mm -hmm. You know, this is a very sensitive thing. He basically exposed her cover. Mm -hmm. Her cover was administrative officer, mm -hmm. and he's just now told me she's the most sensitive target in my embassy. Mm. What do they call it when someone drips a little bit of information? Is that just exposing well, information? Just expo you wouldn't believe what people would tell me. And sometimes <laughs> they would preface it with, Jim, I shouldn't be telling you this. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there. Like, uh-huh, uh, yeah, yeah, keep you going. Know, you know, putting a sock in it, you know, like, hopefully yeah. I'm not going to interrupt this person, you right. know. I've even had them, you know, on the, on the tablecloth, they would draw me a wiring diagram of something. I'd say, can I have a copy of that? Oh, sure. <laughs> wow. I mean, if, you, if you are patient and you ask the right questions, it's, an, it's amazing what people will tell you. And if, you, and if they, you've built up that trust. But... Again, for this young man and me, we had a good friendship. Nothing, though, that I detected was a vulnerability that would lead to a recruitment pitch where I basically tell somebody, you know, Ron, I'd like to, you and I are friends, we're brothers, I'd like to offer you, uh, you know, a, out of a token of respect, a, a uh, consulting fee right. for some privileged insights. that you could, we're, we're a team, Ron. Yeah. Mm. You and I, we're a team. Well, I didn't see anything like that with yeah. this guy. So uh, I go on to my next post, and he stays there because he's still got more time left, but he's now become engaged. And as I said, when I'm after somebody, I'm really after them. He calls me up and asks me to be his best man at no. his wedding. No, really? Right. Right. Like I say, I'm close to these people. I was his best man. So is I, this why we're best friends? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Chris. <laughs> wait for, we're friends, Chris. You got to get right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Privilege access. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I flew back and was uh, best man at his wedding. The night of the rehearsal dinner, I decided to drop a little bit of cover, and I just said, you know, we're brothers, we're close, and if there's ever any way I can help you in your career, I have special channels in Washington which is kind of a fig leaf for telling them I'm more than just a State Department officer. Right. I have special channels. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, well, thank you, I appreciate that. But again, he had no problems. Yeah. Okay. Go forward another two or three years, actually another five years, he's been posted to another country and that's when things start to go wrong in his life. That's when the ultimate cracks in the system occurred and that's because she got there and she was very unhappy. It was a third world nation, thousands of miles from home. And she decided that she wanted to go back to her home country. She had not signed on for being basically living in a third world country, five or 6,000 miles from home. And they'd had a young girl and she took that baby girl and she went home. Mm. And this is a terribly devastating thing for anybody to go through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a uh, absolutely psychologically tumultuous time. It puts you at extreme emotional risk, uh, psychological risk, financial risk, physical. Mm -hmm. Your whole world has been shattered. Mm -hmm. And his world had been shattered. To make matters worse, he gets assigned back to his home country where no longer is his racial group the one on top. There's a new sheriff in town, and it's not from his race. And so suddenly, 
he is frustrated beyond belief. He's a very bright guy, very hardworking, charismatic, a lot like Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, yeah, really. He wrote me an email and he said, Jim, he said, no matter how hard I work, I can never be promoted again. Mm. There's a glass ceiling and I can't be promoted regardless of merit. How can people treated like that give allegiance to the country that does that? Which is a big, come recruit me thing, you know, like a big right. neon sign. And that's when I said, I know you're going home to visit your ex-wife to see your baby daughter for her birthday. How about if you and I talk about other career possibilities? So I flew to that country. I'd actually made up a, a story about how I was going to be in that area. Well, that's true. I was going <laughs> right. to be in that area. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's not like I had any other business, but I'm making a beeline yeah. to that country to meet him. And that time, that pitch took all 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. When I broke cover, I said, you've always been like a brother to me, and we've been close. And for your protection and mine, I never, you know, I had to basically be a little deceptive, and I never really told you who I really work for, but I'm really a CIA officer, and I would like you to be on my team. And he said, Jim, now you've given me something to believe in. And he was the kind of person he had to have something to believe in. Right. Mm -hmm. So he went back to his country, to the foreign ministry that he was in, and he um, told me that when 9-11 happened a few months later, that he was so distraught as he was watching it on the TV monitor in his foreign ministry that he began to cry. And he said that his colleagues were wondering, why was this affecting him so much? He's not an American. What they don't know, Jim, is now I'm on your team. Mm. That's that They transfer allegiance to the new team. Right. Mm -hmm. Because most people, unless they're a pure narcissist or a pure sociopath, and I jokingly refer to myself sometimes as a sociopath, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think I am. <laughs> <laughs> My wife might disagree. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but unless somebody's a pure sociopath or a pure narcissist, all of us have been taught, you don't betray your family, you don't betray your religion, you do not betray your country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And he'd been taught the same thing. So how does he manage that psychologically? He manages it because he feels like they betrayed him first. Right. Yep. He could no longer get ahead in his job. His marriage had fallen apart. He wanted to be part of a new team. He then worked for us for about another five or six years, made enough money to start his own business, and jokingly said later that he wished he had a picture of me so that he could have a caption that said, our founder. Yeah, wow. It seems like it's a thin line between being that, oh, everything's great, you know, I'm living life, financially I'm good, my love life is doing well. Seems like a thin line between that and utter ruin, right? It is one event in his life that changed everything. And in some ways, I'm sure the people that are the harder to get access become much easier if you just wait, if you just wait some time because things are gonna go south and when things, things go always, south. Things always go south and everybody has had upsets in their life. Right. Everybody has stress. Ron said that earlier, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's got stress, otherwise right. you're dead. Yeah, you know, yeah. maybe put a mirror under your nose and see if you can fog it. But, <laughs> yeah. but everybody's, got, everybody's got some stress. Now, it may be relative stress. Your stress may be a lot more severe than mine, but I perceive mine as still stressful. Right. So it depends on the individual as to what that stress is. Now, I'll be frank with you guys. Frequently, it was divorce. In fact, I recruited at least three people within a period of a few years that were going through a divorce and headquarters nicknamed me Dr. Divorce. Mm. But I was there for them, I helped them and got them through it. And in turn, they gave me the keys to the kingdom. Right. What about for companies? Uh, we're talking a lot about countries and turning your back on your country. I would imagine it's a lot easier to do it on your company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to betray your country, which is a huge, hurdle to you get across. To prison. Right. You may right. go to, you know, you're a traitor. You yeah. may, you heard me describe Ed Howard. Mm -hmm. He's a traitor. Right. Okay. And yeah, you'll go to prison for that. But to betray a company is probably psychologically a lot easier for people to do. It's just the slightest little hurt, the slightest little 
uh, well, my boss doesn't like me or my boss right. never gives me credit for things. And so now I'm really massively PO'd. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a lot easier for them to, to do that or at least deceive themselves into doing that. It's still treachery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's a lot easier to it, cross that line. Is that process, is it, is it different for someone working for a company than for the country? I could probably accelerate it much more because, you know, again, to betray your country takes a lot of stress yeah. in your life. It could be a lot less stress simply for me to convince them to betray their company. In fact, I may not have to convince them. They may come to me and say, <laughs> mm -hmm. here's what I've got. This is our latest development. Uh, it could be the new fancy cyber tools. It could mm -hmm. be whatever. And they could have some very unique intellectual property, which intellectual property of a company is the same as classified secrets for a government. Right, right, yeah. So in my opinion, it's much easier to, in fact, we used to do this. We would pose not as CIA officers or as embassy officers, but as commercial businessmen. And we would get somebody on a consulting feed, you know, to do a paper for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it may be of something that's of marginal interest to us, but we want to get you hooked to where, you know, we're paying you a certain amount of money for a paper. Right. And then you've suddenly made, say, $1,500 for a paper that you've done for me. And I say, Ron, that's a, that's a great paper. You know, in fact, I've got a client, and if you could take it just a little bit further in this direction, I bet you I could triple that. Mm. Okay. Sounds like a good deal. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a good deal. I mean, we just want a little bit more of your insights, your special insights into what's going on on this. And if you could do me another paper, I'll, I'll in fact, I'll even raise it to $5,000. Right. People sometimes ask me, Jim, how did you get started as a CIA officer? And it was a kind of a funny thing. I backed into this totally by accident. I was in my last year of law school and the CIA had come to campus interviewing for attorneys for the Office of General Counsel, like any federal bureaucracy or any big bureaucracy. We have to have a certain number of attorneys to keep us either out of trouble or get us out of trouble. <laughs> and I was interviewing with law firms, and so I interviewed with a former CIA case officer named Mr. Bill Wood, who was there to recruit attorneys. We got about three minutes into this, and he says, Jim, have you ever considered the clandestine service? And I said, no. What is that? <laughs> and he said, well, I can't tell you much about it, but I think you'd be good at this. Well, unfortunately, at the time, my wife's mother was very ill, and there was no chance we were going to be moving away from Houston, Texas, to Washington, and then thousands of miles overseas. And so instead of that, I went into a family business. But I hated the business. I was making a lot of money, a lot of money, more money than I'd ever make in the rest of my life, and, and absolutely decided that making money is not everything. Right. It's just not that satisfying. And I would come home at night and complain almost every night. And I did that for like three years or more. And my wife said, Jim, either do something about it or stop your belly aching. Mm -hmm. So I went into my office. I had kept Mr. Bill Wood's card. I wrote him a letter and said, three and a half years ago, you and I met. I was not ready for this opportunity. Now I am. And unfortunately, by this time, her mother had passed away. So that was no longer an issue and, you know, consideration. So I wrote him a letter. And about three days later, I get a phone call from a young woman who never used those initials, CIA. All she said was, you wrote Mr. Wood a letter a few days ago. He's going to be at the Holiday Inn on the Gulf Freeway next Thursday. Can you be in the lobby at three o'clock? I said, yes, I can. <laughs> so... I went, we talked, and he said, I'd like to fly you to Washington. Went there for a series of tests, spent about three days, came back. About three months later, they invited me back. This time I had the uh, polygraph test, which some people call a lie detector. It's not, it's a stress test. Mm -hmm. Had the uh, exam with the shrinks. Gosh knows how I got through that, but I did. <laughs> and a few weeks after that, they called me up and said, we'd like to offer you a job as a GS-11 operations officer. And I said, great. Now, the bizarre thing was, I didn't know what they wanted me to do. I didn't know what an operations officer was. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how, how insane is that? I mean, you know, you're taking a job 1,500 miles away, 
at for about I think it was about a fifty percent pay cut, by the way. Mm. Yeah, and you don't even know what they want you to do. But I was so frustrated with the family business. I thought I'd I take a job on the planet Neptune just to get out of Houston, Texas. Mm-hmm. And I love my dad and my brothers, but I was just so frustrated. Yeah. And my wife, bless her heart, she said, Jim, it's important to you, let's do it. Mm-hmm. So I arrived in Washington on February the 19th, 1980 at CIA and finally found out exactly what they expected of me. They expected me to manipulate, to exploit, to subvert, and to suborn people and to persuade them to commit treason against their countries, to betray a trust. And I found out that not only was I pretty darn good at it, but I enjoyed it. Mm. That's the sociopathic part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you think about people and what they what drives them, it's funny that you went through this whole process of being pitched and you basically had, they had to wait for the cracks for even for you. But when you think about people today and espionage and the world that we're living in, it seems like everybody's mad all the time. There's always somebody upset about what's going on socioeconomically. People are definitely upset. You think about things like the Great Resignation. Do you think now is like just a treasure trove of access for both people that are doing corporate espionage and even like nation state level espionage? I would agree with that, Chris. I think anytime you have a a troubled time, be it now or back in the 1930s when people were, you know, going through a lot of socioeconomic stress. Uh, nowadays, the economy has certainly, the pandemic, you know, drove a spike into the economy. It's starting to recover a little bit. We still have a lot of people that are under incredible stress. That puts strains on marriages, on family ties, on a lot of things. And so again, if I was very good as a stress detector. Mm-hmm. That was one of my talents was I could tell when somebody's stressed. If I'm going to recruit you, Chris, I've got to get inside your head and become you. Mm -hmm. And I have a certain degree of empathy that I want to get inside. What troubles Chris, you know? Is it his partner, Ron? (laughs) 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 But what troubles you and how can I soothe those those roiling waters? And so, yes, I think uh, now is a Unfortunately, a great opportunity for foreign intelligence officers or for people who are deciding to betray their companies. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, it's a, um, it's a ripe time. Now, the way to insulate to a certain degree against that is to treat your people fairly, to treat you, your people like a team. They're part of the team. You may not give them everything they want. That's impossible. But if they feel like that you're being treated the same way that Ron's being treated, and that you're getting proper credit for whatever you're doing, and that you are getting a fair shake, and that people will listen to you. Mm -hmm. Even if you get turned down for some request, maybe you go in and ask for a raise, and the boss says, I I just can't do it right now. Chris, you're you're doing a great job, but Mm -hmm. the company is in bad shape. But if you know, however, that Ron, he got a big bonus Mm -hmm. and stole your work, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that son of a gun. Yeah, that's how I get my bonuses. All right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. This is called the Chris Cochran bonus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, that's, if that's how, you, you know, you're going to feel like, well, to heck, you know, I don't have any loyalty here. Right. When we used to uh, look at, um, say, foreign intelligence officers, and we might have what we call an observation post looking at their embassy, and if we see three or four or five guys coming out at 5 o'clock, slapping their backs and heading off to the pub, I'm not going after those guys. But if I wait a few minutes and I see the loner come out, Mm. the guy who's not part of the team, guess who I'm going after? Oh, yeah. You know, it's like when uh, lions or tigers go after gazelles. They don't get the herd. They go after the one who's limping, Mm -hmm. the one who's who's not part of the pack. Uh, You were a Marine and my son, a Marine. You're fighting for our country, but you're also fighting for your, your fellow Marines. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, if anything, that's at the top of your head yep. is, is the teamwork. Mm-hmm. And if you can inculcate those values in your employees, then it severely reduces the chances that they're going to betray you. Right. As long as they feel like they've been fairly treated. They don't have to, you don't have to give them everything. Just mm-hmm. fairly treat them right. and make sure that they all understand they're being treated the same way. Now, 
Ron may make more money than you, but as long as you think, well, but Ron, he actually came up with a, a good idea. Right. And so he deserves more money. But if he stole your idea, then it's guess what? It's different. <laughs> yeah. We live in a gig economy where we are giving cybersecurity professionals more opportunity than ever. And really any professional in many industries, there's work that you can do as an independent. We hear about the term VCSO all the time, a virtual CISO. And part of the job is to bring your experience, to bring your knowledge from your career into this new role. And it's not necessarily espionage, but right. you might be taking secrets or intellectual property from your current company and using that information as a consultant. I would imagine it's a little bit of a fine line that we dance. Where do you yeah. think we're at with that fine line? I think it's like a huge field of gray because you're right. When you go from one organization to another, you're like, oh yeah, well we did it this way. But I think when you get to the point where you're downloading documents, or it, divulging client or, information, yeah, client information, uh, or financial pricing, mm -hmm. pricing, pricing, things yeah. like that, or maybe some of the, uh, the little tools, the tricks of the trade right. that mm -hmm. you don't put in the patent because you don't want somebody to steal it. But now you know it, and you divulge, and you say, "What we really did was this." Right. And uh, that's you see, there you're betraying a company secret that, and you probably signed a non-disclosure agreement. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you shouldn't be doing that. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there are people out there that are like, oh, that would never be me. I would never betray my country. I would never betray my company. I wouldn't even betray any of my friends. But I know you have a philosophy about like, anybody can be an insider threat. Like, so how, how do you explain it to someone that feels like they would never be in that position? I don't think that anybody I ever recruited when they met me thought, I'm going to betray my country to Jim. Nobody thought that. Right. Nobody ever volunteered to me. I've had case officer colleagues that a Russian or a Chinese or somebody might volunteer saying, you know, I know you're a CIA officer and I'm in a terrible financial predicament that you didn't know about, but I need $15,000 by next Tuesday because I've been gambling away my money mm -hmm. and the, the official funding. And we've had that happen. You know, people, <laughs> they take their official funds and they'll go to the casino and lose it all and they're in big trouble. They're going to be sent not only home, but probably sent to prison. Right. So they come to a case officer and they'd say, but if, if you do that for me, if you give me 15,000 by next Tuesday, I'll provide this to you. I never had that happen. I had to take people from step one down the road to where they would then betray their country. Mm -hmm. And none of them ever, I know, ever thought I'm going to be a traitor for Jim when they met me. Right. And and sometimes it, you know, sometimes I could tell right away that this was going to work. And other times it, as I said earlier, it took years. I can usually get a pretty good feel for this. And this is like any other craft that you have. You become better at this. You become a little smoother. You know, you can predict this. Mm -hmm. I'd say most of the time when I go into a recruitment pitch, I usually know how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. I usually know. And by, I'd say after a few years of, of doing this, I had probably about a 90% track record, meaning 90% of the time I got the person. Right. Mm. Yeah. So, and in the last few years, it was 100%. I was always, you know, right. In fact, somebody one time asked me, uh, well, have you ever pitched somebody that you knew would say no? And I, I said, well, why would I pitch somebody <laughs> that, that I know would say no? Yeah. And in fact, what makes it fun is the, the risk factor that you may have misjudged it, that takes a little skill mm -hmm. My first major recruitment, I was faced with this challenge from CIA headquarters to recruit someone who could give us access to these very sensitive, high-stake negotiations that we were going to be engaged in in a year and a half. And I had fortunately met a man who met the uh, criteria. He had the access. We knew he was going to have that access when he went home. And I'd met him in a, a ski class. We were both taking skiing lessons. So I intensified my developmental phase by basically, you know, taking him out to lunch, inviting his family over for dinner, doing things like that. And after two or three months of this, of building the trust, building the friendship, uh, I proposed to headquarters that I pitch him. Now, what I should have had was some inkling as to why he would accept my pitch, but I didn't. I thought I could recruit him based 
purely on the strength of my personality and the strength of our friendship. Now, this is incredibly naive, incredibly naive, that I could just say, you know, Ron, we're buddies. How would you like to spy for me? (laughs) Not going to work. Not so much. Not so much, yeah. Just just a little bit of hubris, probably. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of hubris, yeah, Yeah, there you go. So, uh, but headquarters was so darn desperate, they signed off on this insane proposal of mine to basically pitch this guy for money. And so I pitched him, and he looked at me and he says, Jim, I really like you, but that would be morally wrong. (laughs) I've pitched close to 60 people in my life, and he's the only person who ever, ever posed a moral objection. Well, guess why normally people would turn you down? Risk of getting caught? Risk of getting caught, exactly. Exactly. If the risk is here and what you just offered is here, they're going to... They'll turn you down. In my first big pitch, he's turned me down. I went away from that. And we have a saying at CIA that it's okay to get turned down, but not to get turned in. (laughs) He was the number two guy in his embassy. And if he went to his ambassador and said, you know, last night, Mr. James Lawler, third secretary of the embassy, propositioned me to commit treason, I could just imagine this ambassador storming into our ambassador's office, slamming his fist down on the table and saying, this is outrageous. Mm. You know, my deputy was propositioned the other night by your Mr. James Lawler. Mm -hmm. You know, huge flap, huge flap. My career was going to go into a tailspin. And now you may recall, CIA headquarters had approved this, but do you think that they're going to remember that? You know, they're going to be looking at me saying, how did he screw this up? Right. They're going to be CYA themselves, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to be the one out there left hanging. So I thought, okay, i got to call the guy. I've got to somehow uh, smooth any rough waters and make sure we're still friends. So about three days later, I finally got up the courage to call him and said, you know, we enjoyed that so much the other night. I was thinking it might be fun to go out again this coming weekend. He said, you know, Jim, I thought that too. That'd be fun. Yeah which greatly relieved me that he didn't hang up in my ear. Yeah. So I went to that second dinner only with the objective of making sure that he and I were still friends, still buddies, right. you know, and no uneasiness. And I still recall we got there, the waiter had dropped the menus off, first words out of my friend's mouth, Jim, that offer you made me last week, is that still good? Mm-hmm. I said, yes, of course it is. We're friends. That's why I made the offer. He said, well, what you don't know was day after that dinner, my wife announced she wants a divorce. Wow. And I can't pay her the alimony to which she's entitled and put my two teenage sons in private schools when we go home next summer because in my country, you can't get a good education unless you go to a private school. I can't do that unless I accept your offer. And then he said, I know it's morally wrong. And I started to say something, but then I remembered something that I learned in law school, that when the judge rules in your favor, shut up and get out of court. (laughs) (laughs) And so he got into it big time. And that's when I found out that it was more than just the divorce, Mm -hmm. more than just the financial pressure. As he handed me the huge stack of classified material from his embassy, he said, you know, I hate my boss. The ambassador steals all of the work I do and takes credit for it and for everything else of everybody in the embassy. And he goes around this country like a little banny rooster, crowing and everything. He is a worthless piece of you know what. Mm. And he said, as I hand you this classified information, it's as if I'm kicking the son of a bitch in the face. (laughs) I said to him, we're friends. Bring me some more of that. And let's kick that son of a bitch. Again. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. So it was, again, he had been betrayed first. He was, he was betrayed. Mm-hmm. And now he got, into, he got into some other motivations later. There's never a single motivation. Uh, for instance, we were going to uh, put him through a polygraph test, a counterintelligence polygraph test, because he was going to go back inside his country and be handled by a colleague of mine who does not have diplomatic protection. We call that a non-official cover officer, usually posing as a business person. Well, in my case, I had the misfortune of having a young operator who'd never been overseas, probably never met a foreigner before, 
And the first words out of his mouth, gee, I'm just curious, why are you doing this? So you could feel, you know, suddenly the hair went up on the back of my neck and I could see this guy storming out. He amazed me. He started laughing. He said, because I think this is going to be a lot of fun. He wanted to be a spy. Wow. So all of those motivations. And ultimately, his relationship with us worked wonderfully. He told us not only their positions, but their fallback positions. And I always like to say, when you're out trying to buy a car or a house, how would you like to know the bottom dollar that you could offer Mm -hmm. the person on the other side of the table? And that's exactly what he did. I met you, you were giving a presentation, you were going through some of your stories, and honestly, it, it changed my life forever. One of the best storytellers I had ever seen. And every opportunity I got to hear those stories again, I brought you into some of the organizations I was working with, and you know, we're having this conversation now, and now you have books. What drove you to write these books? I enjoyed my CIA career as an operations officer a, a lot. And so when I retired, I felt a void in my life. And I'd always wanted to write a novel or novels. In fact, when I interviewed at the CIA way back in 1979, and a guy asked me what I would like to do with my life after CIA, and I said, I'd like to write a novel. And he said, oh, damn, that's all we need is another author. (laughs) But I felt like I can't run operations anymore, really, but I can do operations in my mind, a virtual operation. So I can live vicariously by uh, writing spy novels. They say, write what you know. I know spying. Yeah. And so I wanted to write these novels. I've written two and I'm working on a third one. And for me, the same way I enjoyed my operations psychologically, I enjoy it when I get a friend such as you, Chris, who says, Jim, I really like this book. I enjoy telling the stories. I enjoy writing the stories. And I just love it when I hear a friend of mine say, I like that book. That was really good. Yeah. What are some of the spy fiction that maybe you pulled inspiration from when you were writing your own story? Well, I wish I was as good as, say, John le Carré. I wish I was. Uh, He was a former British intelligence officer. And his books are very realistic. I think my books are realistic. And... My books are not typically James Bond gadgets. Right. I mean, when I was in my CIA career, I was exposed to what I call the toys, the gadgets, but that didn't fascinate me. What fascinates me is the human factor. Yep. And I think that comes out in my books that, sure, there's some excitement. There's, there's got to be some excitement in the book. And my career had its moments of excitement, sometimes sheer terror. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to instill that in these books and create characters who are interesting and who sometimes based on real people. I've got people in both books that are based on folks I know. And if they're some of the good guys, I would actually say, Chris, could I pattern a character after you? And you could even choose your own name and Mm -hmm. things. Now, I've got some of my characters patterned after people I didn't like, but that's top secret. I'm not going to tell you who they are. (laughs) But I tried to make it realistic. I know CIA director George Tennant, he read my first book, Living Lies, and he said, Jim, he said, they should have this as required reading at the farm because of your description of the, sometimes the unfortunate bureaucracy that we have at CIA. And everybody struggles against it, but it's like any bureaucratic organization. You have some people who are very well-meaning, great folks, and then other people who are careerists, who are only in this for a career. For They, they just see it as a job. You have to have passion. And I think, I, th- I hope that my passion comes out. Uh, the last time I went through a polygraph test, the operator said, you know, Mr. Lawler, we go around and we talk to your friends and we ask them, give me one word to describe Jim Lawler. Mm. And the word that keeps coming up is intense. Mm. And I said, I'll, I'll wear that. That's yeah, fine. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Living Lies, uh, love it. I'm not the best friend in the world because I haven't read this one yet, but could you give a synopsis of these two and maybe even like a sneak peek of your, your third one? Sure. So in Living Lies, I wrote this 
back in the year 2015 when the United States was engaged in its first set of negotiations with the Iranians over the Iranian nuclear weapons program. So I constructed a story in Living Lies where, once again, the United States and Iran are engaged in some high-level negotiations about the Iranian nuclear program, yep. and the Iranians run a double agent at us who holds himself out to give us the negotiating positions on the Iranian side. But what we don't know is that the Iranians now have a covert nuclear weapon program that they're not declaring. And so they're only declaring all the other things to get the trade sanctions released. And so it's the conflict between the, um, the two sides within the agency as to, okay, who's the legitimate asset it's easy to write those scenes because those things actually happen. Some of them did. This one, in the twinkling of an eye, is based on the other weapon of mass destruction other than a nuclear weapon. It's based on biological weapons. Mm. It's a conspiracy between the Russians and the North Koreans to develop a very, very devastating genetic biological weapon, meaning that if they had your DNA, Chris, they could design a designer biological weapon that would affect only you right. and basically kill you. Mm -hmm. And so they're using that for assassination and ultimately for genocide. And then my third one is a book about an African-American case officer who's at the top of his game when he is suddenly accused of being a mole, a spy. But he's so embittered that he decides that he will really work for the Russians. And it goes into why he's doing this, what is he doing. It's called The Traitor's Tale. Mm. And it's, it's, again, an exploration of the human heart and loyalty or disloyalty and treachery. With all the storytelling that you've ever done, podcasts, TV interviews, these books, it seems like your legacy is really going to live on even long after you're gone. What does that legacy really mean to you that you're going to leave that mark on the world? I guess uh, that's a great question. I, I'm less concerned about my literary legacy. I think I'm a good storyteller. I may not be the best writer in the world. I guess I'm more content with what we did during my 25 years at CIA in preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction, preventing nuclear weapons, biological weapons, and I only want to get an audience. Maybe I can inspire a few more young people to pursue a career in national security and do things like we did. We were trying to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons and biological weapons. And that is psychologically righteous. Mm -hmm. When you can disrupt and take down a nuclear weapons network, as my team did, it was a weapon that was the same yield, nuclear yield, as the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima right. and killed 140,000 people. Mm -hmm. I'd say that that's worth a lot more than any money I could ever make right. Absolutely. in my family business. That I can look myself in the mirror and thought, okay, I saved some people. That's, that, to me, touches my soul. How, how many people could you estimate that you think you've saved over the years just through the work you've done? Chris, I... I don't know. I, I would hope quite a few. I mean, certainly those. In fact, um, somebody once observed, Jim, if your team had not basically taken down AQ Khan and prevented the Libyans from getting a nuclear weapon, in 2011, a few years after you guys did that, as you may recall, Muammar Gaddafi was being overthrown by his people. He could have had nuclear weapons by then, and he would have used them. Right. Mm. More than one. He would have used them on his own people. He would have used them maybe uh, in Europe to distract attention. Mm -hmm. So I can't really put my finger on how many, but I know we stopped it. Right. And to me, that was worth everything. Mm. One thing I wanted to always ask you, uh, Bill Wood, all those years ago, did you ever ask him what it was about you that made him say this guy would be a great case officer? I never did, Chris, but that is an absolutely excellent question. When I give talks like this, occasionally somebody will say, what, what is it that Mr. Wood saw in you that had him divert totally from looking for an attorney to looking for a case officer? Right. 
And all I can say is because he was a case officer, it takes one to know one maybe. Mm -hmm. I think a fairly decent amount of um, interpersonal skills and he could see this young man shouldn't be an attorney, he should be a case officer. Mm. So that's all I can, but that's a great question because this that one decision of his was what basically diverted me on that path mm -hmm. by, by asking me that if I'd ever thought about the clandestine service. Wow. So you have a passion for what you've done. You were good at it. It sounds exciting. It makes me want to get into the field. But when you I bet you'd be good at it, Ron. <laughs> I, think I think so. so too. I, think I mean, look so. how you've suckered Chris all <laughs> along. <laughs> I'm just a big sucker. I got a bunch of a bunch of spies on me. He doesn't out, even right? know what's going on. <laughs> exactly. But you know, when you look at the other side, the people that you've worked with that were in foreign countries or even at other companies, what would you say could make them more resilient? If something is too good to be true, it's too good to be true, mm -hmm. and that there's a hidden agenda going on. I think. Um, that again, by treating people fairly, by listening to them, making them know that you are sensitive to their needs, their wants, inside of a company, for example, uh, can help insulate against people like me or prevent them from volunteering their services to a competitor. Mm. Watching for stresses in people's lives, you know, okay, it's not, it's not against the law to go through a divorce or to have problems or have children problems or elder care problems. Money problems. Money problems. Right. But the money problems, by the way, nobody ever does this just for money. Mm -hmm. They do this because they love their family. The money is a way to keep score and sure, it enables them to do things, but it's never just money. You know, what we at the uh, agency would have a uh, a community liaison office or a family liaison office or somebody's going through a problem, see if you can help them through the problem. Don't pretend it's not there. The striking thing is it sounds like you were more of that support figure than their country yeah. and Absolutely. their company. And so guess who they gave their allegiance to? Mm -hmm. Me. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I was the one who became what they needed. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, I said the ideal case officer is a shapeshifter. You become what they need. What do you need? And I become what you need. Mm. So that's it. I mean, really, we look at these people in cybersecurity, we look at these people in our organizations as the weakest link because we know they're going to make mistakes. They're human. They're going to mess up all the time. But the best defense against espionage, the best defense against insider threat is giving the people what they need, looking at that hierarchy of needs, making sure that they feel seen, making sure that they are taken care of, check in on them if you see, oh wow, they, they've been late a little bit lately. Maybe I need to check in with them, make sure they're good to go. We spend so much money as organizations buying products, solutions, connecting them together. We have all these programs, we, we hire all these people. But if you have that one person that's in your organization that's willing to let that door open, leave that small window open for another organization, it can change everything. And the only thing that we really can do to prevent that is to treat people like people and care about them. I agree 100%. That would make my job much more difficult, maybe not impossible, but much more difficult to penetrate an organization or a country. All of this is making me wanna go home and tell my family that I love them, tell my team how much I appreciate them because it's the small things that matter. We. We need to show up for our people, whether it's our family or our company and country. So cheers to showing up for everyone. Showing up. Thank you. Cheers.